Hi guys, this is Nomonar. So I think it's about time for me to make an update video regarding my um, SV script uh, framework. And because my last video was made in English first, and then I um, voiced the Chinese, uh, I gave some Chinese voice to the to the audio, and I decided to make this one uh, in Chinese first, and then voice it in English. And pretty much like the other one, I'm going to just not gonna translate everything exactly. I'm just going to uh, translate the important points that comes to my mind. So, um, in this video, I'm going to talk about the main features that I've implemented over this past couple, however many days or months. And I'm going to sh use a demo. I'm gonna take this opportunity to make a demo using uh, this person whose name is, who goes by Curlia, uh, this person's script to copy nodes with the parameters, all the parameters, both node parameters and, you know, uh, vibrato, envelope, loud list, tension, everything with that. And you can carry it to another track or something. So right now in SV, if you copy a node and then, you know, come and see, come and we, it's going to paste in the same track <laughs> at the same exact location as before, as the source node. And that's, that's not very useful for us. Uh, so he, uh, yeah, he or she made this node. Uh, sorry, made this script. And so what I'm showing you right here is that instead of defining these methods or functions, uh, specifically get client info, main, get translations, instead of defining them in the global scope, uh, if you use this framework, you're gonna have to declare them in this, um, function, right? So the function, has a signature that requires to return an object with these three methods. And it's easier to do it this way, right? It's easier to leverage the power of TypeScript if you do it this way. Because you really can't describe what is supposed to be declared in a global scope. You can say what is supposed to be a return um, value, what is supposed to be a parameter, right? It's hard to say what is supposed to be there in the global scope. And um, this function that you need to implement is fairly simple. So it takes in whatever my framework implements, right? So context, SV system, utils, log, all four of these are my code. <laughs> um, let's see what I was talking about here. Oh yeah, and you can see a little bit things are different. For example, show message box is no longer synchronous in here. Um, everything in here will be asynchronous by default unless you do some kind of a hack, which is available, which is available. I will show you, show you that later. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because if you, I realize if I mix synchronous code and the asynchronous code together, sometimes it just crashes. And no, no error thrown, the entire SV crashes. So, uh, well, why don't I just make it, you know, asynchronous? And if, what if you really want a synchronous behavior? Async await is ready for you. Alright? Async await. So this is the polyfill, um, that worked. As, as well as type three compiler that compiles it down to ES, uh, ES5. But, you know, we apply polyfill to implement promise. And I implement, uh, I implemented stuff to make sure promise can work. And I implement something on top of promise, which I will show you later. And after promise is there, TypeScript can, can leverage promise to generate code from async away. And basically what happened just now was I show the effect of using asynchronous, uh, sorry, using async await. All right. And this, this is what I was explaining the asynchronous part about it, which is the farewell, a farewell, uh, message box shows up even before I, uh, type, even I, Typed, um, 
I forgot. Was it was it OK button or something? Confirm button in the message box. It's because this code is, is asynchronous. Loggers are asynchronous. Now here I'm going to talk about the main feature. Well, not main. One major feature, which is you never need to, you know, call sv.finish anymore. Okay, unless you really need to escape from something. And not escape in, you know, a normal if else, but more like escape in an asynchronous callback. The reason being, I wrap around the set timeout, uh, sv dot set timeout, where I add a code to track how many callbacks are there, and how many, how, how many com, uh, sorry, how many callbacks are pending for execution, and when one callback gets executed, you know that number goes down by one, and eventually that number goes to zero, and that means no other code will run ever. And we'll just call sv.finish in that case. Right? That's that's how um that's basically how this works. Which is also why you should be using whatever my framework provides you to use. Because if you call sv.set timeout directly, then you won't be able to leverage that. And you will you will surprisingly find out that your code exits before your callback is called. But because my framework doesn't know about your callback because your callback, you know, bypassed my framework. And my code is... My code is actually not here. But there, this is where uh, I use the, what, what's what I call lifecycle manager. So lifecycle manager is responsible of tracking the callbacks. And here I had to wrap, actually not wrap, but override the behavior of the, you know, the proper promise object uh, and change the then function, then method to, um, to make sure the promise code also can leverage the callback tracking feature. And CoreJS Pure, Pure is open source uh, NPI module that implements a bunch of sh uh, polyfills or shims for JavaScript, uh, not syntax, but JavaScript features. And I use that so that I can I can use Promise to begin with. Because Promise is hard to implement right. I didn't want to do that myself. And this is the list. This is the list that gets injected into the method that I just showed you. So SV is still there, but this SV is going to be the wrapped one. If you're looking for the real SV object from Synthetor V, it's underscored SV now. And I highly recommend you to not use the raw one, because like I said, if you accidentally call something like set timeout, oops, that code probably will never get to run. And just so this this part is just to show how to use it. So right. So my my hello world example doesn't include everything that gets injected into this method. And you can add your additional ones. And whatever is available was shown in the previous screen. And here I'm talking about the logger. Um, so the logger is very simple. Um, we don't write to files, so all we can do is write to the uh, message box. Context. Context is probably the most frequently interacted thing in this entire framework because it literally covers everything. Uh, it covers, you know, you see the clipboard right there, and this part is the host info. Uh, show telling you what's the operating system, what's the version of the engine, and that's not accurate. Uh, in fact, it's not just any string. There are only two choices. So let me fix that real quick. Okay, now that's fixed. And current file name. And whatever node group you are working with, 
whatever track you are working with. Playback status. Oh, I got a hot head of myself. Playback status. Whether you're playing or paused. Main editor. Main editor is the bottom part. That they see the piano row, and that's how, that's the main editor. And arrangement view is the top part. Uh, the part that shows you, you know, all the tracks and you know, relatively timing. And project also needs to own the project also owns a lot of things, including the node groups I was talking about. And this is very important because um, you might think that node groups goes with the tracks, but no, it goes to the project first. No, any node group has to be in project before it can be added to a track. So I solved this by uh, using uh, what you see up there. Uh, uh, so I use the new new no uh sorry the new node group method right um and which is a way for me to make sure so yeah i didn't talk about this in this order but the node node group proxy builder uh has a when you uh, it's a first of all it's a builder but when you call the create method on it it's going to bind that node group object in the background and return you the node group object so in that way, it ensures that whenever you create a node group, it's going to be added to the project. So you will never forget to do that. And SV system, right here I'm talking about SV system, is everything that, that can be called a system call. Right? For example, you know, the quarter is defined in the system. Finish, you are telling the system to exit. New undo record. Well, undo record is basically what can be reverted. What operations can be reverted? You can revert one node creation at a time, or you can revert 10 node creations at a time. You can control that by using this method. Set time outside in immediate set interval. I kind of wrote this. These are not the same as what's in the SV, official SV object. Um, I, I assigned them the signature that's more natural to JavaScript developers, because that's what's in the browser and Node.js. And utils. Utils are basically all the math conversion stuff, right? Because <laughs> there's really nowhere else for them to go. They're literally just utilities, tools. And with the exception for the get time point in seconds and get time, time point in blicks. Now this one in the official API, you need to call sv.getTimeAxis. Um, I think it's get seconds from blicks and get blicks from seconds. And I feel that's too many, too long a method call. Like really, this is should be, this should be offered as a tool, right? So I, that's why I did them here, and I don't in, in, expose them in the in the context API. Because like I said, anything in project should have been you know in the context. Another thing I do, which is I would consider a second feature, is I use the aliasing in TypeScript, right? Because the official API that a lot of things are numbers. Okay, if you add um, add a node somewhere, you're gonna say add it add something, a, a time point, which is a number. But what is this number? Is this seconds or is this blick? And in fact, it's blicks. All right, that can cause a lot of confusion and a lot of bugs. So I use aliasing um, to. Say okay, this is blix, this is measure, this is semitone, this is second, and use them in the uh, in the method signatures. So when you write code, when the developer writes code, he or she will see, okay, this method is supposed to take a blick instead of instead of a second. That can reduce a little bit, reduce some some bugs, right? Um, avoid some bugs. And more importantly, you know, they're effectively the same because it's aliasing. To the compiler, it's still numbers. So you won't get any compile time, more compile time errors than before just by using it. So only benefits, I would say. So yeah, here I'm wrapping up um, about the features. And now I've shifted to doing the demo.
then I just push the fixes. And then I realized I typed something in the com commit message box. And it didn't matter. So, all good. And let's start the demo. So, Curlius script. Um, I ran the linter on it. So instead of wars, you see const, const. Um, and notably, this is the old version of the script because in this version you are still using the. You have to select a node in a target track in order to insert it. Instead of using the playhead or the current playtime, um, and the current version of the script, you let you, you already uses playhead time. So. Uh, this that's why I said this is the old version. And yeah, so I said you know I ran the linter in part because the linter was complaining and I didn't want to see all the red lines and everything. So how does copy work? So you first see. So basically, you need to extract information and store them into the clipboard. And how you do that is you start with getting the selected nodes in the main editor. And, and uh, one thing is all the pitch delta, vibrato, loudness, tension, all of these parameters don't live in a node. They live in the node group. So you need to find out the node group. And here's the thing. The thing is, it is guaranteed that if you can select nodes rather than select, as opposed to selecting node groups, you are definitely, so those nodes are definitely going to belong to the same node group, right? You can never select nodes across the boundary of node groups. So that's why, uh, we can use nodes, nodes zero, which is the first node. Use that node's parent, uh, because we know it's a node group, and assume that that's a node group for all the nodes that were selected. Right, that assumption will be true. So we find out the beginning, which is called onset here, and the end time for the selected group. Um, we'll store that somewhere later. And then we access each node and push all the information into this info object. And then we go to the node group to extract all the parameters from it. In this case, it's rather, relatively um, straightforward because we just... So all the uh, parameters are expressed as control point, which is a tuple of blick and value. So um, basically you just need to extract those and subtract them from, uh, su sorry, subtract the onset from them. So you have the relative onset. And then you will see that the second part, second part, Technically, we can we should have been able to just use the value coming from the get points method. I could write, write just that, but I couldn't because there's a bug in SV. The bug is the values returned by get points. Whatever, whenever the parameter value is negative, it's gonna come back as an extremely large positive number, right? It's like an underflow, I believe. So instead of that, what we have to use is params.get method, because the get is technically an interpolation. But you know, whenever the control point is present, the interpolation doesn't do anything other than re returning the exact same value. So that's why we do this. And this params.get is going to return the correct negative values for negative values. So yeah, that's a little bug in SV that I came to realize later on.
and then you write it to the clipboard. And let's take a look at my code. And let's come out the pasting part. Here, just fixing a little bit of compile time errors. So the code says, okay, we're gonna extract the selected nodes from the main editor. This part kind of looks the same as the original API. And then if I don't detect any selected nodes, I'm going to warn and then exit. And here I'm going to sort the nodes. And the reason being, <laughs> um, SV will give you an array of nodes in the order of selection. So if the user selects the nodes from back to front, then just getting the beginning time of the first node, it's not going to get you the beginning time of the entire group. It's going to oh, it's going to be wrong basically. And here I'm using context of current node group reference dot target. Right. Instead of instead of using you know get parent. In fact, the, in the framework you don't see get parent. I decided to avoid that. Right. Um, the reason being I don't want cycle references because cycle references is the source. It's one source, one of the sources of memory leaks. And with memory leaks, you you will get you will get um you know you will see the memory usage increases even though you didn't do anything. And you'll be like, I didn't do anything. Why? Why is my code taking four gigabyte of RAM and this is crashing? Well, memory leak is why. So in my framework, I'm using, you know, one way references instead of double. Uh, well, instead of two way references. And this chunk, uh, this chunk of code, uh, kind of sanitizes, not sanitizes, just process the the parameters a little bit so the reason being was you have some you have some cases where before the first node or after the last node there will be a control point and that point won't be included in a get points method call and then you have a problem the problem is when you copy this over without the point that's before the first node and the point after the last node your curve is going to be wrong your curve is going to be wrong. So that's why I added that. And to just kind of balance it out, like I could have tried to find that code, find that point, but then I will have to maybe overwrite too many parameters in the target track. Um, so I balanced that with, so I did the trade-off and decided that I will just take whatever interpolated value at the beginning at the beginning of the first node and at the ending of the last node. That way I make sure I don't pollute other control points in the target track. I only overwrite whatever that's uh what whatever that that was that are supposed to be overridden. Here I'm just explaining what that interpolation is about. And then you construct the information to be sent to the clipboard. I don't need this because I don't have any translations.
and you will see that oh, I'm using assignment to a field, and then how does that work, right? Well, this is a feature of JavaScript: the getter and setters. So basically, instead of just a field assignment and a field read, it's going to be a method, right? A method, right? And a met oh, sorry, method app invocation for both of them. So it seems like I'm assigning a value to the clipboard, but in fact, I invoked a method to set the clipboard using SV. And why do I want to do that? Um, especially for using getters, it's going to make objects easily serializable using JSON, right? Um, if all of these are fields, it's going to be naturally serialized in JSON. And that's the main reason. And of course, I have to use the object. I, don't, I can't use the class, because in, in the class, um, if you use a getter, that's going to be by default hidden. So I have to use pure objects. And then using, using setters, um, I just feel it's more natural. And you can reduce the verboseness of set something, set something, set something, set something, right? Although I still use I still use the normal setters, but but using that, using the assignment, using the the field setters specifically can make code a little bit more readable. So now let's look at, uh, I think we're looking at the paste code. And you realize pasting, well, it's shorter. How, do, how does that happen? And this is our source code. And the source code is this part is selecting the node, checking for selecting a node that was talking about. And that, that's obsolete in the current version of the script. All right, so ignore that. Except, don't ignore that, because it's the const index line. This line, and the next line, is about removing that node that was selected. So after this, you can really ignore that part then. So now, iterating over all the nodes. And extract the information from the JSON and assign them to the nodes. So this part, I was able to simplify it, right? Because I wrote something, I wrote a helper in the framework itself to easily do that. And you will see that in a bit. And then you go to the node group, take everything from the JSON, assign them, and in fact, add them to the parameters. And this remove part, this remove part is overwrite, right? So you want to overwrite what, whatever parameter is already there with, um, with the points that are copied, that, that are copied, right? So coming to my code. The first, you want to extract the current time point which is the playhead time and the current node group reference. So in SV, it gives you the current time, current playhead time in seconds, which is not what you want, because you want blicks, because everything you do in the track or in node group or whatever, the, the time unit is blick everywhere. So it's so ubiquitously ubiquitously used, I decided to have both in this context object, just in case you still need a second somehow, somehow. Um, but I guess more, more or less you're going to use current time point all the time. So you're going to get a currently selected node group. You want to pa uh, parse 
the clipboard content, and find out the nodes, find out the beginning time, and then for each node, I'm going to call that helper, which is called from node meta. Meta just means metadata, which is all the information that can be serialized in the JSON. That's how I define node meta. You say, for each node information, I'm going to use that to generate a node. And then change the onsite to be the correct time. Right? So how I calculate it is to use the beginning time of the first node. Um, sorry, the beginning time of this node minus the beginning time of the first node, which gets you gives you the relative onsite, and plus the current time. Current time point. And the next part is trying to simplify the loop for going through all the parameters. So object the entries is going to give you key value, key value, key value. So page order, blank number array, vibrato in blank number array, on loud list, blank number array. So those of these are gonna be passed in together, so you see the key value in the method. And you say, okay, I'm gonna get the automation object. I'm gonna cast it here. And then this if statement right here, I shouldn't have written it because it's good, like, like this test that I'm showing here. Because that's going to reset, not reset, actually, set the vibrato in, in uh, vibrato envelope to be zero. And this is a bug. And it will manifest itself in the demo later. Um, that if statement can be totally just thrown away. Um, I thought it would be useful, but it was not useful. And this is why I will skip translating this part. Still talking about that if statement thing. All right, lastly, I'm going to add these values to the automation, existing automation. Oh, and this part I'm talking about overriding uh, the existing values with the new values. And here you see the blink, right? It tells you you're supposed to give a blink value instead of seconds. And that's why that's the part I said it's going to be helpful sometimes. And then you add the points from the JSON to the automation. So let's take a look. Oh, by the way, object entries is a JavaScript feature in the later versions of JavaScript. And because I use the polyfill, uh, this is available, right? Um, so that's kind of something I touched on in my previous video there. So a lot of JavaScript features that were enabled by using CoreJS. Let's take a look in action. I select two nodes. And pay attention here that the second node has a different lyric. And I modify the node properties so that we can check to see if that's copied over. All right.
I know that that node that point is after the last second node, and that node is before the first node. Note. And then you select. Oh, oops. Copy with parameters. And then change to another time. And paste it. And you can you can totally tell that there's zero vibrato, right? And the reason reason being, you know, I inserted that zero zero point in vibrato envelope, so that's why you don't see any vibrato. So that that wasn't that wasn't right. And then if you select it in. A wrong version. Uh, sorry, <laughs> talking about something else. Uh, in reverse order, you see that still works. That was the second second demo. And you can see the interpolation point in the resulting insertion in the resulting parameter curves. So that's working. So yeah, I'll probably add some docs to this as my next step because you see there's nothing, no docs whatsoever. Probably only I can understand what I'm doing here. Uh, that's not good for a framework. So primarily I'll spend time on that. And on the feature front, I don't have a good idea of what to do or what to change right now. So I will pause that part. And in the meantime, please, if you have the interest, uh, please suggest what I can do with this framework, what I need to change, what I need to add, um, how I can make this a better experience. And if you have the chance to use it, please use it. Give that a try and tell me how it goes. Um, of course, if you have any feedback, feel free to comment on this video or comment on the GitHub or elsewhere or Twitter, whatever works. And that is it. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. See ya.